few weeks ago in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Uh, chapter 1, uh, I've, I've found uh, 2 Corinthians such a blessing. Uh, chapter 1 talks about how that the Lord comforts us in our tribulation. Uh, chapter 1, verse 4, who comforted us in all our tribulation. And then he gives you a ministry that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. You know, God has a purpose in the things that happen to us. And the other thing we saw is that it's a real faith check. And when you're going through trouble, it, it, it helps you to see what you're really trusting, who you're really trusting. And that, that's an important thing. He also talked about our conscience. You know, when trouble comes, it's good to have a good conscience. <laughs> you know, you don't want to add that to it. There in verse 12, our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we've, we've had our conversation in the world. You know, what a blessing it is that God can work with us and, and help us to have a clear conscience. Then in chapter 2, we saw Satan's devices and victory in Jesus. You know, Satan has his tricks. He's always, he never takes a break. He's always working. But he's not very, he doesn't do anything new. He still uses the same old tricks he's always used. Unfortunately, we tend to keep falling for him. But we don't have to be ignorant, he says in, in chapter 2, verse 11, of, of Satan's devices. And we need to remember that, verse 14, Now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ. And we have victory in Jesus, and we need to, to live that and understand it. Uh, I mentioned this morning, I, I think we're experiencing and we will experience uh, Satan's devices. Whenever we, you try to do something, uh, you, know, you try to step out and do something good for the Lord, there's, uh, there's just going to be resistance to that. Uh, so be aware of it. Don't, don't be ignorant of, of that. And uh, be in prayer. You know, the Bible talks about whom resists steadfastly in the faith. And uh, God can, can help us through this. Tonight we're looking at responding to criticism. And of course, none of you have probably ever been criticized, so this, this won't have any, any meaning to you. Now, we've all experienced it. And, and by the way, criticism has its place. You know, it's a normal part of life. Many times it's a necessary part of life. You know, if you're about to touch a live wire, you, you appreciate it when somebody says, hey, you, you may not want to touch that one. <laughs> um, I, I went to a friend's farm one time and I inquired about this new fence. I said, is this a new... <laughs> and boy, I got a, a shock and it was the kind that makes your muscles tense up and I couldn't get like, loose of it. <laughs> so I wish he'd criticize me and said, don't you touch my fence. But uh, he didn't. Uh, you know, Paul was constantly criticized, and he had to deal with that. He had to be spiritual uh, about it, and that's one of the main themes of, of 2 Corinthians uh, is that Paul was answering his critics. You know, some would say, oh, he's no apostle, uh, he's no good, uh, you know, he's just in it for the money and so on, and uh, we need to understand how to respond to, to criticism. Let's read 2 Corinthians 3. Let me start in verse 1. I'm just going to read down through verse 6. Do we begin again to commend ourselves? Or need we, as some others, epistles of commendation to you, or letters of commendation from you? Ye are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart, and such trust have we through Christ to Godward, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Responding to criticism. The short answer is, the best way to respond to criticism is with a changed life. You know, looking to God for the truth of, of the matter. Sometimes when people criticize, there'll be some truth to what they say, and we need to respond to that. Sometimes there isn't, and we don't need to respond. But we need to know the difference between the two. Uh, the truth is what matters. He talks here about, in verse 1, am I going to need to get a letter of recommendation from you? Now, what do we call it here? Reference, you know? I've had people sometimes ask me for a reference. Boy, you're... you're uh, you're in trouble when you ask me for a reference because I, I tell the truth. <laughs> you know, if, if you don't come to church and you, you're getting a reference from your pastor, 
Man, you're not going to get a very good reference. <laughs> yeah, they're, I think they're a member. I think they're still alive. <laughs> you know, we, we can write lots of things, can't we? And uh, yeah, some people write an autobiography. You wonder how much of it's true, you know? Uh, and he's saying here, do I have to get a letter of reference from you? Am I going to have to have you write down, oh, yeah, Paul, he's, he's okay. Uh, references are oftentimes biased or inaccurate. Uh, we can write whatever we want to about ourselves, but what's the actual truth? Uh, it, you know, it's not what others say or, or even what we say. It's what we actually live. It's what, what the truth of the matter is. And that's, that's a real key thing in responding to criticism is what's the truth? You know, if someone's criticizing and, and they're 10% right, we'll deal with that 10%. If they're 100% right, deal with that 100%, you know? Uh, criticism has to be dealt with by, by truth. And it doesn't matter what we write, it's what, we're, what the truth is. It's what we actually live. Uh, and he, he talks about them as a living letter. Uh, there's a song, maybe it's something else as well, but uh, what you are speaks so loud that the world can't hear what you say. So that's what we're talking about. The living letter is the important thing. Now the Bible uses the word epistle. That just means a letter. It's a letter that uh, is written. And you know what others see, or more specifically, what our life is, is what really matters. You know, our church has a letter. Our church has a testimony. And that's one of the things he talks about there, is that they're his testimony, that church there. Uh, if you've been around for very long, you'll see some amazing statements that churches will make you know, in their advertising. Uh, you know, the church where no one is a stranger. Uh, the church where hearts are healed. Uh, I was looking at some of the names of churches. That gives you an idea. Um, the Healing Place. No Limits Fellowship. Uh, you, you've seen them. There's all different kinds of claims that, that churches will make. But, and I hope they're true, you know. Uh, our church is called Fellowship Baptist Church. I hope it's true. You know, I hope we're getting fellowship and, and doing the right thing there. But you can write whatever you want. The most important thing is, what are we living? Yeah, you know, we can say, the greatest church in the world, you know, or whatever. Uh, but you know, that's, it's not what we write, it's, it's what's true. It's what we're doing. Um, as, a, as a church, it's important for us to have, to understand our testimony is based on the truth of the matter. And Paul presented them, the church at Corinth, as a living recommendation. If Paul needed a recommendation, it was them. Go check out the church at Corinth. They're, they're my reference. Now, there's two sides to that. Paul's side and the church's side. You know, as a pastor, I'm responsible to, to teach and to live right. Verse uh, 5 there, he says, Not that we're sufficient of ourselves to think anything is of ourselves. You know, it doesn't matter what I think. I, that's not why I'm here. I'm here to present the Word of God. Our sufficiency is of God. And, and a, a pastor is responsible for that. Is my influence as a pastor pleasing to God? Well, your side is, how are you responding to my teaching and my leadership? You know, that, that's your part. That's your part of the testimony. You're my living recommendation. How am I doing? <laughs> you know, at work, at school, where you are. What are people going to think of me when they meet me if they know that I'm your pastor? That's what Paul is, is talking about here. Um, in Hebrews chapter 13, just very clearly and plainly, the Lord says that a church has a responsibility to their pastor. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they that must give account. You know, a pastor is going to give an account of his leadership before the Lord. He says that they may do it with joy and not with grief. That's unprofitable for you. We have a, a testimony. We have a letter as a church, and we're both involved in it. Your home has a letter. You know, there's a testimony that your home has. Now, you can say whatever you want about your, your home, but the, the truth is what, what people see. Uh, parents are to lead. Children are to obey. Uh, you know, there, there should be harmony, and there should be good things happening in our homes. Uh, in your personal life, your life has a letter. It has a testimony. Now, there's things that people see about you. I was reading, I can't, even, I can't remember the name of the book now, but a pastor was writing, and 
He was saying that how that somebody at church had given him a hard time about some characteristic he had. And he said he was with some other pastor friends and he was grumbling about it, saying how they'd criticized him for this characteristic. And he said they got real quiet. He said, it's not true, is it? <laughs> he said they were still really, really quiet. Uh, they were right <laughs> about him. Uh, that was part of his letter, his testimony. He had this quirk that uh, he really needed to, to change. Uh, we have a testimony. And, and the key thing is, you're personally responsible for your testimony. I'll, I'll never forget when I realized that I had a testimony to my parents. I, I was pretty old. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't 10. I was you know, older than that. And, and I realized that there were things my parents saw about me that affected my testimony. That, that was startling to me. And, you know, we can't blame our testimony on anyone else. A wife can't say, oh, I have a bad testimony because of my husband, or, or vice versa. Now, the possible exception to that might be little children, you know, whose parents are not, not doing right. But eventually, as children, we reach a point where we can't blame our parents anymore. <laughs> and I know psychologists like to do that. But we have a letter. We have a testimony. And it's important that, that it be right. What are people reading in your life? You know, the letter of your life. What are people reading in your life? And does the written letter match the living letter? It should. If it doesn't, we call that hypocrisy, you know, where we claim one thing and we live, live another. There's some verses in 1 John, 1 John chapter 1, that I think kind of picture this. 1 John 1, verses, I'll just read verses 3 through 5. That which we've seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be, may be full. This then is the message which we have heard of Him and declare unto you, that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. And what, what he's saying there is there were certain things we experienced, now we're writing about them. And it was very important that they be the same. And it's the same with our life. It's important that, uh, that our life not be hypocritical uh, as, as Christians. The Bible tells us in Luke 6, every tree is known by his own fruit. What we are will, will come out. Look with me at 1 Timothy chapter 5. This is, I find this a real interesting couple of verses. 1 Timothy 5, verses 24 and 25. First Timothy 5.24 says, Some men's sins are open beforehand, going before to judgment. You've known people like that. You think, oh, they're headed for trouble. <laughs> and sure enough, they get in trouble. Some men, they follow after. You've known people like that. You hear about them in the news sometimes. Somebody will do some terrible thing, and they'll interview the neighbor and say, oh, he just seemed like a normal guy, and we didn't, we didn't know. Yeah, but there was something inside. There was something different in their heart than what they were we're presenting. You know, it's really important that we, uh, we be right with the Lord. Uh, our fruit will come out. Verse 25 says, Likewise also the good works of some are manifest beforehand, and they that are otherwise cannot be hid. Now, there's some people you're surprised when something good comes out of their life. <laughs> you know? Uh, but they're, they're, sometimes people are a little different. They're rough on the outside, but uh, you know, heart of gold kind of a thing. Uh, fruit will come out. And as Christians, we need to be honest. We need to be transparent. And if we are, criticism won't be near as hard. We'll just take it. You know, if it's true, we'll deal with it. If it's not true, we'll ignore it. Uh, sometimes we're wrong about that. So it's good sometimes to ask, you know, get a, an opinion. A wife is a good place to go. They'll be pretty honest with you. Uh, or husband. Kids, man, they're great. <laughs> they have little hypocrisy finders, you know. Uh, the fruit will come out. We need to be honest. We need to be transparent. Listen, if... If the label is different than what's inside, ignore the label. I bought something while we were gone. I bought something that was, the box said, medium. I got it out, put it on, and I thought, this doesn't fit. Looked on the, the bag on the inside, it said, extra large. <laughs> it wasn't labeled right. And, you know, we can, we can claim to be whatever we want, but the truth of the matter is what, what makes the difference. Uh, some people present a great written letter as long as they do the writing. But there's no hiding the, the living letter. And the most important living letter for you to be concerned about 
is your own. It's real easy to criticize others, but the one you need to be concerned about is your own. You need to be right with God. Uh, James chapter 1 and uh, verse 26, a couple of verses here in James. He points out a, a deception here. James 1, 26, If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. You know, sometimes there's people who put on an affront of religion, but there's a, there's a problem. Later on in, in James chapter 3, verse, um, verse 14, he says, But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. You know, we, can, can, we can claim to be as spiritual as we want, but if, if these are characterizing our life, God says, no, you got it wrong. Verse 17, but the wisdom that's from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Uh, why do our lives get so turned around? You know, why is it that many times we're not living what we think we're living? Well, it's because of where we look, where our focus is. And, and that's the, the next point there in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Uh, he begins to talk about uh, our look. Uh, let me read starting at the end of verse 6 there. He, the end of verse 6 is, For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. But if the ministration of death written and engraven in stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could, could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. Now, let me just say this. What he's talking about here was the giving of the Ten Commandments. That written in stone. You remember the account? Moses got it. When he came down, his face glowed. It was glorious. It was an amazing thing. But that was the law. So he says, verse 8, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. Listen, the law only condemns us. <laughs> you never get commended by the law. It, you know, you might not break it, but if you do, there's no mercy. You know, I mean, it's, it's just the law. It's condemnation. It's, it's death, he said in verse 7. He said, if that was glorious, how much more glorious is Christ? Grace. Verse 10, For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelleth. Interesting verse. He's just saying, it seemed glorious until Christ came along. <laughs> and then it was like nothing. Verse 11, For if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth is glorious. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. But their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. For even unto this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now, he's just talking there about if... When you're criticized, or in your life, if you look to the law, man, you're in trouble. If you look to the law when people criticize, well, I've done this, and I've done that, and I've kept this law, and that law. Uh, listen, that's a, a fading glory. A and it's a, a ministry, like he says, of death and condemnation. If you look to the law, the book of James says there's no hope. In fact, he, uh, James 2, verse 10, he says, Whosoever shall keep the whole law... And yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. That's the ministry of the law. You know, if you want to look to the law, see, that's where the cults look. Uh, that's where legalist, the legalistic, legalistic attitude comes from. And the problem is, if you look to the law, eventually you're going to have to edit your life. <laughs> you're going to have to change definitions. Uh, people, I've known of people, heard of people who believe in sinless perfection. The Bible doesn't teach that. But if you believe in sinless perfection, what you have to do is you have to change sin to mistakes. Oh, we don't sin anymore. We just make mistakes. And, and if you look to the law, it, it warps you. It, it corrupts you, really. 
Uh, we call that hypocrisy, cover up. Uh, there's only condemnation in the law. And he talks about that in Romans chapter, chapter 3 when he, he says that uh, the law, well, in another place he says the law is to bring us to Christ, but he says the law is there that every mouth may be stopped. It's Romans 3.19, that all the world may become guilty before God. Uh, where we look makes a big difference in how we deal with condemnation. If you look to the law, oh, you're going you're gonna to respond in a different way than if you look to the Lord. Our look needs to be to the Lord. Look at verse 17. Now, this, this comes off of verse 6, uh, where he said, The Spirit giveth life. Verse 17, Now, the Lord is that Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image, from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So you don't look to the, law, to the law, look to the Lord. Keep your gaze on Him. I have a book about prayer, and one of the things it, it taught, and it has a diagram, is you gaze at the... Uh, you, let me get it right. You glance at the problem, you gaze at the Lord. You know, in life, you can spend your time looking at all your problems, and you'll have a miserable life. What you need to look at is the Lord. You, you glance at your problems, you gaze at the Lord. And the Bible says He'll change us, and He gives us liberty. Liberty is the freedom to do right. You know, sometimes it's just hard to do right, isn't it? But God will help us. God will give us that liberty. And the problem is, if you won't admit wrong, you can't do right. If you go along doing the wrong thing and you won't admit it, you're not going to be helped. And liberty is not the liberty to sin. The Bible calls that bondage. <laughs> you know, when you're trapped by sin, that's bondage. That's not freedom. Uh, verse 18, he says, We all with open face. Now, he's relating that back to the veil that he talked about with Moses. Unveiled, no cover up. You know, when criticism comes, if we're trying to cover up, we won't like it. Oh, shouldn't have seen that. No, cover that up. But if we have an open face, we say, oh, yeah, I, I do have a pimple there. <laughs> you know, God's helping me with that. Uh, criticism won't, won't affect us nearly as much when we have an open face. And he says, beholding, with open face, beholding. That word means tarrying to look. Now, let's be honest. The way you look in the mirror. You know, you get right up there and you, man, you look at all the things. Our house, we even have a three-way mirror. I can see the back of my head. I mean, who would want to see the back of my head? I mean, <laughs> uh, you know, we, we really look, don't we? And that's what he's saying. We need to look at the Lord like that. Really look. Beholding. And he says, with open face, beholding the glory of the Lord. And that's important. A lot of times people spend looking at their failures. Others looking at their successes, or others, they look at other people's failures or successes. That's not where we need to look. Another place he, he talks about what a mistake it is to compare ourselves among ourselves. Uh, we need to look at the glory of the Lord. And he says what happens then, you see it there in verse 18? What's the next words? Are changed. If we're going to be changed, it's not going to be by worldly philosophies. It's not going to be by uh, fleshly wisdom. It's going to be by, be by looking to Jesus, looking at, at the Lord. And the problem is hypocrisy or cover-up stops the change we need. If we're, if we're trying to cover up, we're not going to be able to deal uh, with the, the things that God is bringing into our life. We're, we're not going to be able to deal with criticism. And it'll, it'll drive us further away from the model of Jesus Christ. But if we'll just be honest and open, deal with it honestly and openly, man, it, it doesn't have to be that, that complicated. He, and the thing he says we're changed into is into the same image. That's like Jesus. That's God's purpose for us. Uh, Philippians chapter 3, uh, verses 20 and 21. According to the clock, we've got plenty of time, so... Philippians 3, verse 20, he says, Our conversation is in heaven. That means our manner of life. We're heavenly citizens. From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We're looking for Jesus, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, 
according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. That's the same thing we're talking about. You look to Jesus, he changes you. He makes us like him into, into the same image. And then there's a, a couple of words here, from glory to glory. You ever thought about those words? You know, when you get saved, glory, God saved. Well, then God begins to make you like Jesus. Hey, we, we had a girl, I've told you this before, she, she'd just gotten saved, she came for dinner, and, and she swore. She, she used a swear word, and then she said, do we say that? <laughs> no, no, we don't say that. Glory. Yeah, change from, not just saved now, quit swearing. You know, being made like Jesus, glory. And then someday he's going to take us to heaven, glory. <laughs> you know, glory to glory. That's what he's talking about. Uh, what a wonderful thing it is. But it happens as you look to him. First for salvation, and then to be like Jesus, looking in, uh, into his face, into his word, and being changed uh, from glory to glory into the same image as by the Spirit of the Lord. See, this is not by works. It's not by figuring. <laughs> it's not by man's wisdom. It's by the, the Spirit of the Lord. Hebrews 12, I think we read it this morning, said, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Uh, where you look makes a big difference. If you're looking to the world, the world's philosophies, if you're looking to your family, you know, for some people, it's so hard to get away from, from their family culture and philosophy to Christ. It can be so hard. You know, what a blessing when you, you grow up in a Christian family uh, where, where there's freedom you know, to, to trust the Lord. We sing a song, Look and Live. You know, some of the words are, look to Jesus now and live. And that's what we're talking about. You know, in your life, now that, that's the key, your life, your circumstances, these are precious truths to live by. You know, what a blessing it is that, uh, that we can see that uh, God has this truth that we just need to be honest and open, unveiled faces, uncovered, transparent before God. And God can change us as we look to Him. We all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Uh, use these truths. Uh, be real. Be honest. Be changed. And the change will be a good one as we look to Jesus. We'll be, be more and more like Him. Uh, we're going to close with the song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. I thought that would be a a good conclusion for this. It's page 204 in your songbook there. I don't know, this is a, not a difficult subject, but we're constantly confronted with our failures, aren't we? And the tendency is to cover up. But as the Holy Spirit deals with us, and sometimes as people deal with us, we just need to be honest and open and humble, and uh, just let God change us and uh, be what He wants us to be. Now, sometimes you'll get false accusations. You deal with those in a, in a different way, but the key, key is the truth. What did I say? Page 204? Somebody